Good morning, party people, and welcome to Sofia, Bulgaria. I'm here for the Present to Succeed conference uh, run by friends of mine out of uh, here in Sofia. Friends of mine who actually, one of them used to be a Microsoft certified master of SQL Server and then pivoted and uh, went into teaching people how to do presentations. I was super honored when they asked me to come give a session on how to do demos, so I'm really excited for that. Uh, flew in a couple days early so that I could get used to the jet lag. It's almost exactly opposite uh, time zones from Las Vegas. So uh, right now, as we speak, it's about 8 a.m., which is uh, about 6 p.m. America time. So I'm kind of good right now, but we'll see how it goes through the course of the day. Uh, what you see behind me there is the Cathedral of St. Nevsky. There's a morning mass that starts here shortly, so I'm going to head in there and get my holy on ask for a blessing before I start doing my, uh, or start to do my presentation tomorrow. Uh, so let's go through your top voted questions. I actually printed them out because I only brought my camera. I don't have a separate phone to go through my question. Or I only brought my phone. I mean, didn't bring a separate uh, phone or device to go through my questions. So I had to print them out. So the top voted question is from Live is Life, who says, after migration to a new database, my old three terabyte database is read only. My friend's enabling compression and he's already got it down to one and a half terabytes. The goal is to get faster reads and a smaller database. What are your thoughts about this? If you want to get a smaller database, that absolutely works. I'm less stressed about the size when we're talking about a read-only database. After all, if it's truly read-only, if you're setting the read-only properties, I'm not too worried about doing active backups on it. Uh, so, you know, not, what are we worried about size for? You can buy a two terabyte drive off of Amazon for, what, 50 bucks now? Even when you talk about cloud space, it's just not that large. Now, you did say for faster queries, the thing you'll want to think about is indexing the bejesus out of it. Because after all, if it's not changing, indexes aren't going to hurt you that much. So, sure, the size is going to become larger, but terabyte and a half, really, it's not that big. Your laptop drive is probably larger than that. So I, those two goals are kind of at opposites of each other. I'd focus on whatever the users are going to be most impressed with, which is probably going to be faster reads, which probably means better indexing. Next up, my T got cold says, is Enterprise Edition really seen as the norm? Blogs and the official documents often point out things that aren't available in standard, but I've gone my entire career without seeing Enterprise. It depends on the data size. The larger that your data is, the more normal Enterprise Edition is. In the data that we get out of SQL Constant Care, I can tell you that by the time you get up over one to three terabytes, Enterprise Edition is the majority of the market. It's not all of the market, but it is more than 50%. Next up, Ethical DBA says, Hey Brent, have you ever faced any moral or ethical issues in your database career that caused you to really question the task you were working on? So I worked for an alcohol company at one point, a company that distributed alcohol, wine, spirits, and so forth. And I had friends of mine who asked, hey, do you have any ethical challenges with that? And me personally, I was always like, no, it's legal. It's available over the counter without a prescription. If that really is a moral and ethical challenge, try to make that product illegal. You know, try to go uh, outlaw it. So for me, it really hasn't been a thing. I can see how people would I had a thought exercise once where I asked myself um, if the mafia came calling and they wanted me to be their database administrator, would I do it? And I came to the conclusion of no, because that's like actively hurting people, you know, actively going out and, you know, robbing people or whatever. But for everything else, I'm kind of like, eh, it's okay. It's not that big. Gun companies was another one where I was like, well, it's legal. And, you know, if somebody really didn't want it legal, they'd outlaw that. Uh, with nine lock says greetings as someone who is a household name <laughs> I assume they're talking about you not me when it comes to the SQL server community have you noticed members of the younger generation joining the community to give back if yes are there any that you recommend following 
No, we have a little bit of a crisis in the SQL Server community, and it stems from a few things. This is going to be, I think, a little bit of a long answer. Before the pandemic, Microsoft was hiring a lot of the MVP community. It was hiring a lot of people who frequently gave back, did presentations, blog posts, and whatever. That's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with MVPs going and getting jobs at Microsoft. But what Microsoft accidentally did was they took all these contributors out of the community and then put them in positions at Microsoft where they weren't encouraged to give back. And Microsoft is infamous for working its people really hard. They don't uh, tend to not to give as much back to the community once they're at Microsoft. Uh, I'm sure there's going to be one or two community contributors who are like, that's not fair. Yeah, but for the vast majority of people, that, that is what it is. So that was strike one. Strike two was the pandemic. And when the pandemic hit, uh, our hugely active in-person community, uh, the SQL Saturday community, all these conferences, just shut down. And now we're at the point where uh, a lot of people uh, who are coming up in the world aren't necessarily coming up in SQL Server. And when they are, they have to be taught the, the benefits. I should rephrase that. They don't have to be taught, but they don't know the benefits of uh, do, giving back in person, going to conferences, speaking, uh, doing live streaming, blogging, etc. There just hasn't been that uh, big community around SQL Server uh, for the last, uh, say, three, four years. So I think we're at this weird crisis where the SQL Server community somehow needs to jumpstart itself back to life if it's going to come back to life. I don't know that it ever will. I don't think that's a problem with SQL Server. I don't think it says anything negative about it, but it's just a weird position that we find ourselves in uh, where we have to kind of start it back again from scratch. I, I've talked about this with other senior members, not all of them, but other senior members of the SQL Server community. And as the more senior folks start to retire, they, they don't see it as their job to grab that torch and start to light the way uh, for other members of the SQL Server community. So I don't know what the answer is. And it's something that I do think about in terms of how I'm going to contribute back and restart that community. And I have a hard time with it, too, because I'm trying to go kickstart uh, stuff over in Postgres. Not that the Postgres community needs kickstarting by any means, but try to kickstart my own work over into Postgres. So it's a really interesting challenge. Um, you had asked, is there anyone that I recommend you follow? The thing that I would check out is the New Stars of Data conference. If you go check out the New Stars of Data conference, it's people who have not presented at other conferences before. Uh, so you'll find rising stars there. They don't necessarily have a big social media presence or a long track record of YouTubing or presenting or whatever. But that's one place where you can find new people who are just getting started. All right, let's see here. Next up, we have Rober who asks, what's the scariest RDBMS you have worked with? It's not an RDBMS relational database, but it's Excel because Excel gets used as a relational database all over the world. People store data in it, then they're surprised uh, when the data in it turns out to be hot garbage. Nothing against Excel. It's just in, it's in how you use it. It's a tool. The same problem can happen with SQL Server. It's just that there's more guardrails built into SQL Server than there is in Excel. DTDBA says, do you think using the force seek hint everywhere is okay? I have a client who just started doing this. They're not specifying the index. They're just saying with force seek. Yeah, it, it's bad because there are times when a scan is better. If you watch my free How to Think Like the Engine class on YouTube, uh, I give specific examples of where a scan is actually the best execution plan that you could get. Um, so if, if they're trying the query with and without ForSeq and they're making the conscious decision that they believe ForSeq is better, great. But like you point out, as soon as indexes change, that can be a really bad idea. 
Candy Siegel says you've got a helmet on the shelf, referring back to my home office. Is that for show or do you have a motorcycle in the garage? Um, that is part of my Stig costume that I wore at Sequel Bits, the London or UK conference for databases. They uh, do costume parties every year, and I went as the Stig one year with the full face shield helmet on. No one could, I mean, you could recognize me if you got up close because you could see the, my eyes through the, the visor. Um, I don't, I have been on the fence about buying another motorcycle. I had one when I was in my teens. Um, I really love motorcycles, but they're just so dangerous. And the older that I got, I was like, I don't really feel safe on these. Uh, and the, the worse, you know, when you get into cities that have really bad traffic. Um, being out in Vegas, there are a lot of places like Red Rock and uh, uh, Valley of Fire State Park and Mount Charleston where I would love to ride a motorcycle. But I just keep coming back to, oh my God, I feel like it would be dangerous as all hell. I got a friend of mine, Brian Maynard, who uh, comes into town like once a year and drives motor, rides motorcycles, he keeps talking about renting a bike while he's in town. And I keep thinking that we should both rent bikes when he's in town and I'll go, you know, see, decide whether or not I want to do it again. Uh, but we'll see. I, I don't know. Who knows? We'll see what happens. I still love the way bikes look, but. And, and I like to park a car in the house, right? You've probably seen from my Instagram that I park different cars in the house, have big French doors, and I just roll a car right into the house. Um, but uh, the what, we're looking to buy in another house, and when we move, I'm probably not going to be able to fit a car in the new house just from the way that driveways work and all that, and it would be much easier to put a motorcycle in the house, so I'm kind of thinking that might be an interesting way to go about it. All right, let's see here. Next up, we have Mike who says, is there a good criteria to tell if a, a query is OLTP or OLAP? The way that I like to think of it is, if you're dealing with, say, five or ten rows at a time or less, it's transactional. If you're dealing with thousands of rows at a time, that's analytical. Why do I say that? Because if you're going to paint a web page, if you're going to paint the results for a web page, show me my order, show me the, the uh, uh, items that I have in my cart, you're only dealing with a handful of rows. An outlier would be 100 rows. But if you have more than 100 rows, you're not really putting that on a web page. You're showing pagination. Pagination. Woo! Uh, instead. So in pagination, you can do with, you know, in a transactional system, 5, 10, 100 rows at a time. Um, analytical users tend to want to group across thousands, millions, or billions of rows. Show me all the sales aggregated by territory, by month. That would be analytical. So row count is the way that I illustrate that. Vegas DBA says, hi Brent, do you ever do any big physical to virtual conversions? I've been tasked with an aggressive timeline to convert several physical AGs to VMs. I was considering using AGs to fail them over. Was curious about your thoughts. It's been probably 15 years since I did P to Vs. And even back then, if I had any other alternative, I did any other alternative. The only time when I would do P to Vs is if I had an unsupported version of SQL Server on a standalone VM, like some old 2008 box or something, then I would P to V that. But otherwise, if you have an AG in place, just go build another replica, add it into the AG. So that way it's virtual from the start. It affects things like device drivers, backup software, all that. So just go virtual from the start. And next up, Mike says, is there, are there any good up-to-date articles that describe the differences between junior, middle, and senior DBAs? Um, so for me, I don't think that there's good uh, guardrails on what each of those mean. What it usually means in the industry is years of experience. I don't know that I've ever seen it written out, but my guess would say that between zero and three years of experience, most people would probably call themselves a junior. Above three years of experience, people might just call themselves a DBA. And maybe above six or seven years of experience, maybe less even, people would call themselves a senior DBA. But it, you know, there, there's a really good saying, do you have 
10 years of experience or do you have one year of experience that you've done over and over again? I know people who call themselves senior DBAs who really just have the same year of experience working in the same shop, working with the same 10 servers, all queried in a specific way where they call themselves senior and they've never seen anything outside of their little snow globe. On the flip side, I've seen people who only have like two or three years of experience, but they have faced incredibly hard problems at, at crazy shops. And I, they have so much experience gained so quickly that in any other shop, they would be the senior DBA. But years is usually the way you look at it. Mike continues with, where do you develop next after becoming a senior? It's up to you whether you want to stay in the database uh, industry or not. I, I don't know that you would say that there's a higher title beyond that. Team lead or architect is one way you could go about it. Um, but what a lot of people find is after they hit a ceiling, uh, a salary ceiling in database administration, whatever that number is, that they decide whether they want to go into management or whether they want to do consulting, just because that's another way you can make more money. Uh, and we'll do one more Davros. Davros says, when a traditional clustered index table starts to have too many indexes, is this an indication that the table should start using column store? No, not at all. The quantity of indexes has nothing to do with that. And in fact, you can hit column store tables that need row store indexes. I talk more about that in my Fundamentals of Column Store class. Um, you can take the quiz about that over at columnscore.com. It's like column store, but with a C in it, column score. Uh, and then you can take a quiz about your table. That'll tell you whether or not you're a good fit for column score, column store indexes. All right, that wraps up our morning of questions here in Sofia, Bulgaria. I am off over across the street to go attend mass there at the Patriarchal Cathedral of St. Alexander Nevsky, I think it is. Um, I just started reading the cathedral's uh, history website uh, this morning, and I was blown away by how deep it was. So I'm really looking forward to going over and seeing it. Absolutely beautiful building. Looks uh, totally amazing. This is a very pretty part of uh, Sofia as well. Very charming little town. Um, I would recommend it based on what I've seen so far. Very charming. Um, it was funny, Boris was asking me, have you ever been in Eastern Europe before this? And I forgot, I had been in uh, Poland a few times, uh, and I loved Poland as well. So uh, Eastern Europe is probably a part of the world that I need to uh, dig a little bit deeper into. So thanks for hanging out with me today, and I will see you all in the next office hours. Adios.